And can you open up to John chapter 12? John chapter 12 will be some of a, somewhat of a theme verse for us tonight as we look at John 12 verse 24 to 26. If this is your first uh, prayer meeting with us at Hope, I'm very glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, any show of hands of people who, for whom this is your first uh, prayer meeting? All right, there we go. Welcome. And uh, uh, the rest of you, no doubt, are veterans. Our habit is to look at one of the uh, events or outpourings of the Spirit in revival upon God's church at some point in history. And usually we pick uh, one that will usually go by a name of some kind, right? The, the New Hebrides Revival, the uh, 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 the Great Awakening, uh, uh, the Businessman's Revival of New York, something like that. Tonight's revival has no such name attended to it, uh, firstly because it's so little studied and so little known, but also because the name that is attended to it is actually just the name of the revivalist, the Methodist, the preacher and the evangelist, William George Taylor. Before we get to him, let us see what the Lord says in John 12. Look at verse 24. Jesus himself said, Truly, truly, I say to you. He's unpacking here a key and a core kingdom principle. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now this seems at first simply an agricultural principle. Seeds, unless they break down, die, and are obliterated under the earth by water, it will remain only a kernel, only a seed, only a, 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 a grain. But when in the ground, dying, dissipating, being destroyed, corrupting, you might think, it is actually releasing itself and receiving those nutrients able to bring forth life in the form of an entire crop and hundreds more seeds to follow. Jesus therefore applies it spiritually and says, whoever, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. There are some amazing promises there from the Lord Jesus Christ to ministers of his gospel. Everybody who releases your life now will gain it for eternal life. Everyone who dies administering the gospel to a dying world will, through that death, birth life into the world. Every single person who follows Jesus, Jesus is with them in the following of him. And everybody who serves Jesus is honored by the Father. Those are amazing promises. And those are promises that define and mark the life of William George Taylor. He was born in Yorkshire in North England uh, in 1845. He was saved at the age of 12 during a uh, Methodist prayer meeting. Um, and then he uh, became, at the age of 16, a street preacher and an evangelist. The Lord blessed him in uh, very short order. Within a few months, by July of that year in 1861, he saw his first convert. And that's when his new life really began. He understood that God blessed the preaching of the gospel. And so a few years later, when there was an, a, a call coming out from this new colony, this new penal colony uh, called uh, New Holland or New South Wales, what you now call home, uh, Australia, uh, there was this call coming from the Methodist preachers and missionaries who had, who had started to flood uh, at the turn of the century, about in the 1800s, instead of just one or two who had gone down, there was, there was, there was many, dozens, who were going down there and getting there. The first thing that they experienced is the tyranny, this is a very uh, common theme in Australian history, is the tyranny of distance. It's not so much that there's huge crowds and so so much work or that there's uh, such hard ground. It's not particularly those things. It's the tyranny of everything was so spread out. Everything was so far away. And so these Methodists were traveling simply so far back and forth. And <coughs> so when uh, William George Taylor, W.G. Taylor, heard the call for more ministers to Australia, he threw his hand up at the ripe old age of 25 and on the, uh, uh, the, uh, at some point in September, I believe it was the 26th of September, he got on a, a boat from England and he sailed all the way to Australia. It was a hard and a difficult uh, journey on his way here. 
It says that he, um, he experienced all uh, 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 extremes of the globe as he went from England and then down through the equator and suffered under the, under the equatorial sun uh, in the heat. And then he went further south and they uh, drove past icebergs in the uh, southern seas and then finally came to Australia. <clears throat> that was in 1870. So he was 26, uh, 25 when he left, and he arrived in Australian soil, placing his foot upon our great land on his 26th birthday in 1871. In 1874, on the 25th of February, 25th of February, 1874, he married the wonderful Anne Sarah Roby. Here's the measure of her love. He wrote her a letter because he remembered her from school. That's pretty distant. All right, guys, don't give up hope. Then she may yet just remember you from primary school. He wrote a letter to a girl back in England that he remembered from primary school. This is a long-term crush. And she got on a boat and took a three-and-a-half-month voyage. She almost died multiple times. They were surprised that she made it. So enduring is the power of love in the heart. And she arrived in Brisbane, and he married her later that year. Sickness and all. He was such a romantic, and I love this. I love a good family man who is also an evangelist and a pastor. He says this in his... Um, a, a, somebody writing about Taylor says, Taylor declared that, that, that they were... Um, that Taylor declared that he and Anne were still enjoying their honeymoon when he wrote his autobiography 45 years later. That's smooth. He loved her very much. She evidently loved him. He died leaving her behind with two children in Sydney on the 24th of September, 1934. So he lived from 1845 to 1934. His life is marked not only by the verses we read by Jesus, but also what we see in Daniel 12 verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness will be like the stars forever and ever. Taylor considered in his autobiography and many who spoke to him and knew him, he considered that any opportunity to, to preach that did not aim at winning converts to Jesus Christ was an opportunity absolutely wasted. So tonight, as you ask, well, is this a biography uh, talk or is this a talk about an event of a revival? My answer is yes to both. W.G. Taylor's whole ministerial life was a traveling revival everywhere that he went. And it's part of my job tonight to convince you that the kind of revival he left behind and experienced everywhere was true, was God-sent, and was genuine. It was not the hype and charisma of a man like we see in many uh, more recent revivalisms and revivalists who, oh, everywhere they go, they have a crowd and they counter however many thousand conversions. I want you to see it was not that kind. He is an evident uh, example and manifestation of Jesus' promise, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So here's the timeline. 1870 arrives, uh, uh, leaves England. 1871 arrives in Sydney, Port Jackson, for his birthday. Uh, it said that on the trip, um, other than the sun and icebergs, he also had a visitation from the god Neptune. That wasn't a vision. He just means the storms, you know, the, the old myths. The, the Neptune uh, seas almost killed them. He saw all around him, right, single, young, 26-year-old fella from a small town in northern England. Uh, he's surrounded by drunkards and ladies uh, uh, on this ship uh, the whole time. He said, it was an opportunity for the studying of the poor, fallen human nature. Right? This is an English guy. He has a really polite way with words. Uh, I studied total depravity on that ship, is what he was saying. And yet, as a 26-year-old, with these hardened sailors, some convicts, some free men, he still was able to hold religious services. And he did so on the boat. Jesus' language about him is true. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This has already, already on the boat trip, he is acting like a self-denying, dying to self missionary, a seed into the ground. Uh, and his prayer, he, he, record, he records this, as he took his, at the moment that my foot first touched Australian soil, I found myself involuntarily offering the prayer, Lord, use me in this land to lead many souls to thee. That is a good prayer for a Christian's life. 
In the first month that he was in Sydney, he traveled around preaching with his good friend, uh, who was a a missionary who had uh, obeyed the call as well. But within about a month, he was separated from Sydney. He was voted on to then uh, go up into the Moreton Bay District, which is now known as... Brisbane, there you go. Moreton Bay uh, is, uh, is the bay itself, but Moreton Bay District was sort of the entire area that became uh, uh, southeast Queensland, Brisbane. Um, he, uh, for, for some context, 1824, Queensland was uh, established um, as a penal colony for the worst of the worst up from Sydney. So when the convicts were misbehaving too badly enough, they came up to Brisbane, hoorah. Uh, They settled, I would guess, between Ipswich and Logan, uh, my hometowns. uh, uh, And then uh, in 1842, uh, Queensland was opened up to free people to come and settle as a colony by the Crown. And then in 1859, uh, the Crown awarded it its state independence and it became its own uh, uh, independent colony. Um, But we also need to understand, as, as... William is sent north at the uh, ripe old age of 26 into Brisbane. You have to understand how the Methodist organization, uh, ecclesiology, uh, functioned. It's very different to many other churches. And this was part of the power uh, and part of the peculiarity of the Methodists in their early days. So rather than having a monarchy-appointed bishop and then uh, a, a sub, uh, sorry, archbishop and then other bishops and then prelates uh, like the Anglican Church would have or the Episcopal Church would have, they, uh, and instead of Presbyterians that would have local pastors joined into presbyteries over church, the Methodists had a circuit, uh, they had churches, circuits, and districts. So basically, if, you're, if this was a Methodist church, uh, we would have, okay, there's 45 or so here tonight. Um, usually about, not more than 20% of you would be, would be qualified yet to be members. That's kind of average. And to be a member, you have to go to every single Sunday gathering. Pretty fair. You have to go to every single Sunday class. All right, pretty intense. You have to be at every midweek prayer meeting because are you a member of this body seeking the favor of Christ on this land or not? What in the world are you doing? And if you failed any one of those, oh, sorry, and to become a member, you had to be able to uh, prove, uh, point to the moment that you were converted, and you needed to be able to show that you were evangelizing and bringing other people into the faith. If you failed to meet at one of those gatherings and it was found you were not in hospital or attending to somebody in an emergency, here's Sunday morning announcements. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I have a list of those who are away. Tani wasn't here Sunday morning, and they would receive a a formal rebuke. You have now been rebuked in the presence of God. uh, I love to pick on Tani. You're so fun. Uh, And and Chris, uh, uh, you were not here on Sunday evening prayer meeting, and there was no legitimate reason given. Now, to us, that sounds like a cult. To them, that was simply the power of the ordinary obligations. You're a Christian. You signed up to be a member. What are you doing? Are you in this battle or not? That was how it was for them. So if you were a member, that was you. If you were just here and you haven't yet been uh, uh, met the standards of membership, then you would be an attendee. And you're, you're welcome to be here, but you're just an attendee. Each of their churches, which were scattered around, they were sort of joined together into what were called circuits. And there was one minister who was paid who would attend to multiple circuits depending on the population and, and the spread. Uh, so one guy would, would uh, preach at one, ride, preach at another, ride, preach at another. And then sometimes if he couldn't get to all of them, he would do Monday services for the other, uh, for the other churches. And he would rotate like that throughout the week. Those circuits, so there was like, multiple circuits up in Queensland. And the, the entire uh, broader area of multiple circuits was called a district. Uh, at the time that William uh, was sent up into Brisbane, uh, there was only three Uh, ministers to the entire district of Queensland. That means there was three circuits, uh, Albert Street Circuit, uh, I believe it was um, Darling Downs Circuit, and then one other one, and there was only one minister per, which means they're traveling a lot of space and overseeing a lot of people with that Australian tyranny of distance. So he was sent up to Brisbane in what is now known, uh, what is now Brisbane, what was then called the Albert Street Circuit. Multiple uh, Methodist churches, I think there was only two or three, were around in Brisbane in the day that he came up in 1870. The uh, Albert, at, uh, William at this point says, I went up to the historic Albert Street Church. Now, the church was only about 30 years old at this point because it was started in 1847. But it was quite well known because if you remember, Queensland was only open to settlers in 1842 
And in five years, they had had enough uh, Methodists move, enough Methodists sacrificially give, so that they could build a large, beautiful, wonderful church building, uh, Albert Street Methodist Church, which still stands today. Have a show of hands of anybody that goes out to KGS and does some evangelism and street preaching there. You've seen this church. This is now the gay-accepting, woke agenda-pushing Albert Street Uniting Church. Now, Synagogue of Satan, it was one of the most powerful preaching uh, places in all of Queensland, and W.G. Taylor was there. Next time you're in the city, see if you can't just go in there and look on the inside. It's a marvelous, beautiful city, uh, uh, church. Anyway, he was invited up to there in 1870, and uh, he says, we were permitted to witness, notice the humanly passive language already in this language. Not, I came and I brought a revival. He says, we were permitted to witness a truly remarkable revival. And he said, God did it. We just saw it. We were just among it. It happened to us. We're just a kite caught in the storm. He says, and this spread to every part of the circuit. So, so that main central church over the next two years was able to see the reviving work spread out. In uh, 1873, he ends up moving west to the Darling Downs. That's the Queensland uh, uh, province sort of west of the Great Dividing Range, west of the Great Mountains, uh, towards Toowoomba and onwards, uh, Warwick, Toowoomba and onwards. In 1876, he moved from Warwick to Toowoomba. And in 1879, he was sent down to Sydney, uh, well, to New South Wales in Taree, and then uh, did most of his labor in the re- few decades ending his life in Sydney. But what we're studying tonight is the first nine years of his ministry. Arrived in 1871, left Queensland in 1879, and that is what we are studying. How if anyone serves Jesus, the Father will honor him. So we'll start in Brisbane, we'll look at Warwick, and then... Uh, uh, Ipswich and then Toowoomba. These are the four uh, Queensland areas where William G. Taylor saw revival. He says, when he arrived to Brisbane, now he doesn't mention this in his autobiography, it's as if by the time he's writing, he's completely forgotten. But in his, uh, when they voted the, the circuits, uh, the, the heads of the circuits and districts at the conference voted for him to go up to Brisbane, the Brisbaneites had said, don't send us anybody else uh, because we can't aff- uh, we've built all these buildings, now we're in debt and people aren't getting saved, don't send us more people that we have to pay and support. And the, 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 the you know, denominational leaders didn't listen. They sent up this young 26-year-old guy anyway and didn't tell him that they didn't want him. So he arrives and he's all hopeful and he gets there and they are vicious towards him. They don't want him. They have to pay for him and they formally requested to not have to pay anybody. And so he begins preaching, but he says, we were witness to a truly remarkable revival. Let me read to you what is uh, uh, accounted for us in this book. I recommend this. It's hard to get, but if you can, grab yourself Australian Christian Life by Ian Murray. It is one of the most inspiring books I've ever read as an Australian Christian. This is what he says of that time. He says, uh, My first Queensland converts were given to me at Albert Street within a few weeks of arrival. I had preached from our Lord's words, If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honour. He preached upon that, and the spell of God was on the people. And before we separated, five persons were led into the joy of conscious pardon of sin. Side by side knelt two women, one a fallen woman of the street. That's polite English language for a prostitute. One, the wife of a Presbyterian merchant. And though she was a Presbyterian, she had snuck out out of curiosity. It's weird to visit other churches back then. Not so much in our day. It's weird to visit other denominations back then, especially when you're more respectable Presbyterian. Your husband's a very famous member of uh, the city. But she snuck out and came in and got saved. Although, uh, because she was led in curiosity to come and hear the new chum preacher. God got her. Gradually, the work spread. At South Brisbane, the the communion rail, so um, uh, if you've seen this old church or other churches like it, the pulpits up top uh, and and underneath where people would come forward to receive communion was a small rail that you could lean upon or kneel upon to pray and receive communion. uh, That's where where people would flood down to 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 receive prayer and uh, talk about uh, their soul's state. It says that communion rail was filled with penitents almost every Sunday night service. 
The meetings were frequently marked by a true Pentecostal influence. Albert Street and then Fortitude Valley and other Methodist churches in the city soon caught the flame. It mattered little who was the preacher, the power of God was present to heal. Necessity compelled our arranging for extending meetings, and these went on week after week for nearly four months. We saw, we had the joy of seeing over 400 who had professed faith in Christ. All my life, I've lived in the midst of revival work, but I've never witnessed a more scriptural, more deep, more permanent work of God than this. Some of you might remember that from my address at Stand Firm. He says this, four months, 400 people got saved. That would be the equivalent if we did the, that equivalent amount of people getting baptized here. Remember, they, they were Methodists. They didn't baptize new believers only. They also allowed for infant baptism. So it's not always baptisms. But that would be the equivalent of us doing 25 baptisms every single week for four months because that's how many people are getting saved. We are currently doing about three or four a month on average. Imagine 25 a week. You wouldn't get to your Sunday lunch. Sorry, you're here all day celebrating new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. It goes on. Uh, uh, oh, he tells this story that I've struggled to put it in because it's so moving. He tells this story of a young guy who had been who, not young at the time of his writing and his time in Albert Street. And I'm telling you, you can go to the church that this happened in and see it and pray for reviving work in that dead church and in our church. But anyway, this guy was an old man. He was 84 when he came forward in one of these meetings to receive salvation. 84 in 1971. The average life expectancy for Australians in 1871 was 35 years old. He's well over double the expected age and he's had well over triple the hardships in his life. When he was a teenager, he married a young gal. And to make ends meet, he got a job at a factory and foolishly, he stole $70 worth of silver and a, silga, sil, and a silky handkerchief. And for that, a grand injustice was done to him and he was sent to the penal colony of Australia and he never saw his wife this side of eternity again. He was just plucked up, put in prison. He didn't hear from her that from the day he got arrested. She was scared and then he was shipped off quite quickly for $70 worth of thievery. And he got here and he was uh, among the, the, uh, the southern states, but he was so frequent in his, and as you would if your wife is back home and you are 19 years of age, he kept on trying to escape and he would be continually whipped. Then when they finally opened the worst of the worst up in Queensland penal colony, he was sent up there. Again, continual insubordination and escapes and he was whipped. It was said at the end of his life, he kept count, there was 1,731 lashes that he had received. You, you would struggle to put a single ballpoint pen's mark upon your back and find space for 1,731 strikes. Whips, lashes upon his back. He would have a back like, like, like chalkboard, like concrete, hardened by scars, unrecognizable as human. It says that as he came to Brisbane, all the devil that was in him came to the surface. Yet now, as an old man, the, uh, uh, the, the queen had given him pardon. He is over 80 years old, and finally the queen says, you've done your service for, 80, for stealing $70 worth of goods. That's a grand, what a wasted life. An entire life in loneliness, in brokenness. For 60 years, he had never heard from his wife. He was a lonely, broken old man, and yet he hobbled down to the communion rail on Sunday night. There he wept, there he prayed, and there he was converted. And his conversion was true and evident to all who knew him up till his death. The Lord preserved him so long so that William Taylor could be there to preach, he could be there to hear, and that old dying man could receive the living word. Amidst this Brisbane revival, William G. Taylor kind of had the, the ideal life for a pastor. First, he's a, he's a single guy, but his ideal life is this, wake up early, study. Noon comes, visit houses and visit Christians and talk to them about the Savior. Evening, prayer meetings and preaching, sleep. For a single guy, that should be your life goal. 
especially if you want to do ministry. That's awesome. Uh, now, by the time his wife got there, life looked different. But at that point, that was what he was doing day in, day out, continually. He was run off his feet. He said it was one of the most joyous times in all of his life. And then the Methodist denominational leaders strike again. He had a funny word for him. He called them the Methodist police. So they struck again and they sent him west. He's kind of like a Philip, right, in, in, in the book of Acts when he's in the midst of a Samarian, Samaritan revival and God says, all right, go down to the other road. I've got somebody else to meet, for you to meet. And there he goes and there's this one chariot with one Ethiopian. That's what it was like for William. He went west and he went to Warwick and there the buildings of the... I'll read you what, what, he sa- what he says about the building of the church. But he got to Warwick, then about 2,000 people um, in that uh, sort of whole district of Warwick. And the church was in a low ebb, spirituality, low ebb. Uh, they were very embarrassed by how few people went were, were in their churches that had been built a few decades earlier. It says this, There was an old slab building in which worship was to be conducted. Like, you're supposed to be able to worship God in this thing. They said... If you were to, if you, uh, you could fall down and worship that building without breaking any of the Ten Commandments. For it was not made after the likeness of anything in the earth or in the heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. Because <laughs> you've never seen a building like this. <clears throat> Well, anyway, he got there and he says there was an immediate outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which became an immediate solution to the depressing problems that I found awaiting me. He says the um, remarkable influence of the Holy Spirit at our Sunday evening service settled down upon the congregation. Many were bathed in tears while I preached. And before we separated, 11 persons came forward as seekers of salvation. Among those, among them being the two circuit stewards. That's deacons. Their deacons got saved. Between whom for several years there had been an estrangement and a fight. This was a new thing in Warwick and it naturally caused much comment. All these, these Warwick small town Australians, oh, there's this, there's this Methodist revival. They all start talking about it. But within a, um, uh, at once the little slab church began to fill. He doesn't leave that building alone. A little slab church began to fill. And within a short period we were compelled to take our Sunday night congregation to the town hall, which in turn was soon filled to the doors. Meanwhile, a truly remarkable work of God had broken out and the influence of which affected the whole district. That's a very large area. Many churches, many houses, many uh, uh, many miles across the whole district. He says um, uh, of that uh, uh, revival, there was 127 people that were converted in a short period of time. He says that I have this list of 127 names right in front of me that I still pray for and thank God for. And then he lists the, he says, uh, basically, this is, these are 127 people that are still walking in the faith or were until they died. But he says, I can furnish no finer argument of, than this to quiet the quibbles of doubters as to the permanent character of the results of revival work. In other words, lots of people didn't believe in revivals. They're a big show. They don't last anything. Well, not under William G. Taylor when he preached the gospel and was met with by the Holy Spirit. He says, decades later, 127 names still in front of me. Some became members of the upper parliament. Some became uh, well-to-do merchants and leaders in the community. Some became the mother and father of Australia's first Methodist missionary who went, lived, and died in India as a missionary. He says, this was a lasting work. He then says, uh, I love, you know, just at the stage that we're in as a church, thinking, praying, strategizing, praying more about what to do with our building and space, he has this section where everywhere he went, he had to do a building fund. He, he had to build a new building because nowhere was big enough. And he says, um, uh, well, he was very thankful to have a new building because he hated that old one. <laughs> the soul saving work compelled us to face a building scheme. Now, that little band of believers had longed to be able to build a small brick church at the cost of 600 pounds. But this blessed work of God altered all of that. And with a joyous heart, the people set to work to build a commodious church. All through my life, I've demonstrated this fact. Given a real, live, spiritual church built upon evangelistic lines, and you will never worry about matters of pounds and pence. The money will come. 
when the right atmosphere or the right liveliness has been created in the people. Before the Warwick revival, the officials were perplexed to find any money with which to pay one, one uh, uh, probationer. But after the revival, I was paid £10 a quarter. Doesn't make much sense to us, but anyway. And then he was gifted with a cut under buggy for his horses. No more riding a horseback with his poor, poor wife uh, all throughout the Australian bush. Nonetheless, the Lord made a great move. They had to build a large church. And he says here, from this venture of my time in Warwick, in my three years, I have the following. 728, uh, 700, 465 sermons. That's 2.9 sermons every single Sunday over three years. And then you go... Well, that's not much. I mean, midweeks, right? No, no. Additionally, prayer meetings were 428. Also, sundry meetings, like just whenever they were called, I went and preached there, 188, making an average of between seven and eight preaching engagements per week. I traveled 11,532 miles, which is an average of 76 miles per week. That is... 129 kilometers per week on horseback without roads. That's the equivalent of getting on a horse and going from Brisbane City all the way to Toowoomba in one week, stopping preaching at seven or eight places along the way. That's hard riding. No Bruce Highway, no Cunningham Highway, no bitumen. Rock, bush, horse. That is hard work. And then there was a gracious outpouring in Ipswich. In 1873, there was a, a decent and there was an expectant Methodist church. They hoped for a revival. They had heard what was going on. They were praying and William G. Taylor passed through town. They asked multiple churches for cooperation in prayer. And he says this, As the Sabbath dawned, we arrived for the prayer meeting at 7 o'clock at church, which was unusually well attended. And our people were in large expectation. Afterwards, we had the Sabbath school. And there seemed to be an awakening upon every student. They were all in deep distress, distress, seeking Jesus for pardon. Then by the evening service, six people came forward in penitence and were saved. By the Monday night prayer meeting, there were 20 people saved. On the Tuesday night, 30 more. And then again the following night, at least 30. And during that week, not less than 100 persons, hardened sinners, Backsliders and self-righteous moralists were renewed and made happy in the Lord. Night after night, 400 people assembled and waited until 10 p.m. for the good things of the Lord. Every night for multiple months, prayer meetings of 400 people or more in little old Ipswich. An intense feeling of concern was felt throughout the whole town, not just the churches. Not one, there was not... There was on one occasion where we were sent for in the middle of the day to go in haste to pray for four adult persons in one house who were under deep conviction of sin. That's the dream. You're just doing your study, knock on the pastor's study door. You've got to come and run down the street. There's people who need you for salvation. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. They had a month of meetings with over 200 people converted. Months of meetings, 200 people converted in Ipswich. And then... Then he got to Toowoomba. Where's Toowoomba? Here's Toowoomba. I've got it all on paper. Didn't even have time to put everything down into my normal notes. He got into Toowoomba in 1876. Again, the Methodist police moved him on, is what he says. And he had to climb up the mountain and get to Toowoomba. There, though, it was a large town of 6,000 people. Wow, big. Uh, and and he, he sp I want you to listen to how he describes the church, the Methodist church in this bang center of Toowoomba, and how he describes it. I want you to listen for the problems with this. I'm going to ask you for considerations. He says, On our arrival, we were welcomed by a congregation of lovely people, intelligent, well-to-do, and alas, contented. For years, they had worshipped in a brick church that had seated just 80 people, placed right in the heart of a rapidly growing town with already 6,000 people in it. They had a sweet little organ, they had a select little choir and a beautiful little carved pulpit. And they were as happy and contented as could be. Anybody hear the problem, the near heresy with this church? Anybody want to throw out an idea of what's wrong with that? Town's booming. They're this quaint little sitting on their lawn. Is there a lit How many times did he say little? A sweet little choir, a nice little organ, a cute little pulpit, and a tiny little church that they were contented in. 
He says, they were too contented by far, but I was restless. You see, I was little more than a lad, and a lad full of enthusiasm. He's 30 years old. A lad full of enthusiasm that would persist in finding voice. This is funny. This is him writing to the Methodist denomination saying, please give us money for a bigger church. They said, you don't have enough people to support that. He said, fine. Listen to what he goes. He says, uh, at the quarterly meeting conference, I made my case to that Lilliptulian <laughs> gathering of really old men, sorry, godly men, who smiled and wanted to pass on to the next business. But I was persistent, and I pleaded all that I knew how, but pleaded in vain. At least, at last, with desperation, I cried, at least meet me this far as an experiment. Let us take the school of arts in the middle of town for just one Sunday. To end the discussion, they agreed to this. On Sunday morning, we met and in the School of Arts and we had a congregation of 300 people. And at night, the building was filled by at least 500. They were in a building of 80, not even filling it. How God blesses expectancy. Our own people were amazed. Wow, look what could happen. <laughs> Wow, and when it was seen that the collections of money had more than doubled, even the circuit stewards were converted. It happened again. We never went back to that old little church. Little is underlined in this book. But here for 18 months, we gathered for worship, and in that hall, many signs and wonders were wrought. Ere long, the question of a new church was mentioned. Who will build it? How will we do it? But with little hope of success... Until, just like in Warwick, the Lord took the matter into his own hands. And by a gracious and wonderful visitation of the Holy Spirit, a blessed revival swept the town. And as the immediate result of that revival, our present lordly church was built. In every sense, that was a remarkable spiritual movement. It represented Toowoomba's first baptism of fire. They never left that old they never went back to that old church. They built a new building and they got the work of the Great Commission done. This is William G. Taylor. Every, this is just within nine years. Everywhere he went, dozens upon hundreds of people converted, staying in the church, giving their money to the church, uh, becoming members, which again means regular attendance, approved life of, of holiness, and, tur and, and turning up to every meeting that they have. This was the life of William G. Taylor. He who honors Jesus, the, uh, who serves Jesus, the Father will honor. I want to speak briefly about the methods that he engaged. Though he was a Methodist, in fact, because he was a true early Methodist and not one of the fanciful Methodists that came in short decades after the fact, which he sadly lived to see and lament, his methods were some of the purest, most ordinary means that could be imagined. So he says, in his uh, language of Brisbane, he says that the, w when that uh, very first revival hit Brisbane, when he was there among that disgruntled congregation, he says, it broke out in the ordinary course of our ministry. No outside missioner was uh, invited, but every single Sunday, and frequently at our midnight meeting, uh, prayer meetings, the power of God came upon us in a remarkable manner says, there was no attempt to get up a revival. It simply came down. And in such a fashion that people went from far and near and they came to see Jesus. This is a true mark of his preaching. His ministry, his revivalism was nothing more than just doing the ordinary things of church, even less than many other Methodists. He, he was not emphasizing or requiring uh, revival meetings. He would just get there, preach Sunday, travel, preach Sunday, travel, preach Sunday, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, prayer meetings. Let's see what the Lord does. Preach the gospel, evangelize the lost, call the complacent, the lukewarm, and the backsliding to repentance and true faith in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit blessed it. And uh, uh, towards the end of his life, as he's writing about all of these things, he says this, The work began where all genuine revivals should begin, within the church itself. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon that infant church and then followed the gathering in under one sermon of 3,000 converts. The Pentecost, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon that infant church and then followed the gathering in. 
This is his emphasis. It has to start with the church. It has always been thus. Would that every church member in Australia, sorry, would that at this writing I could reach the ear of every minister and every church member in Australia and across the world. It would be with an earnest cry for the church itself to wake up and put on its strength. It would pay us a magnificent dividend to seize for one twelfth month period all of our aggressive evangelistic agencies. How missionary does that sound? We as a church should stop for 12 months all evangelism and to give ourselves to the one task of bringing back the church itself onto apostolic principles. No wonder the failure has so often to be written across our event. No wonder failure is so often written across our evangelistic efforts. With the church itself formal and self-contained, we lack the foundational elements of successful evangelism. A strong church, a reformed church, a biblical church, a preaching church, a repentant church, a revived church has to be the first principle of upon which and from which revival and evangelism happens. Other, Leonard Ravenhill used to say, of, God, of course God doesn't give you a, a souls to be one. You don't deserve it. You'll bring them into your church and disciple them into lukewarmness and Christ-hating. Whoa, Ravenhill. That's the problem. God's saying, well, I want to give you my children, but what will you make them? You'll make them precisely as you are. It is impossible to disciple people into a Christianity that is not currently exemplified zealously among a people. They will become whatever we are on average in this church. And so he was saying, unless the church is revived, unless the church is biblical, unless the church is preaching the gospel, we shouldn't, we don't have the right to do evangelism. In Toowoomba, the, the work began silently, slowly, among our own people. No special missioner was invited. No unusual efforts were put forth to awaken public interest. There were no flyers. The work grew from within. And gradually, a fire kindled that went on burning in connection with the ordinary ministries of the church. That's a powerful lesson for us. Prayer meetings, Sunday gatherings, prayer on Sunday, evangelizing, communion table, uh, watching baptisms, Bible expositions, singing gospel songs, fellowshipping, inviting people over, intentionally engaging the new people and the lost people, sitting on these ugly, uh, uh, not in the likeness of anything in heaven or on earth, chairs that we have, and talking to people who don't know the Savior yet. These ordinary things are the heating of coals that eventually bring forth great revival fire that start inside the church's own operations. Here's what Here's what William G. Taylor, for all of the extreme, we might think, extreme fruit in his life, here's what he said about the revival in Toowoomba. It was spontaneous in its outbreak. It was natural, though rapid in its development, and its results were abiding. Those three things is what we want to pray for. A true revival is always spontaneous. It is always surprising. It always takes us off guard. And if you don't think that, then what you're expecting is that you can schedule some kind of revival. No matter how much we pray, no how, hard, how hard we work or evangelize or preach about it, you cannot expect a revival. In the sense that you cannot know it is coming until it has come. The expectancy is that God can, God likely will, we're going to believe and prepare ourselves for it. But as it comes, even for William G. Taylor, who always believed in revival, it was always spontaneous. Because you can't do it. God does. Spontaneous in its outbreak natural though rapid in its development right lots of souls lots of baptisms lots of new members lots of training speed and rapidity is not unnatural it is not unhealthy don't be afraid by it it was natural though rapid in its development you should pray for that Lord, give us the ordinary things, pastors meeting with saved, uh, newly saved people to bring them through the waters of baptism, and then in a few months, then going for membership and then becoming uh, members of our church, serving, seeking, saving the lost and bringing them in. Young men getting trained up for ministry, getting married, starting a family, and then going off to plant a church. Uh, people coming to church, getting saved, uh, becoming members, and serving Christ in their life. That, 
a hundredfold faster than what we're currently seeing it, that's revival and not some other ingredient of superstitious power. Ordinary, done quick. And its results were abiding. So this is what we're praying for. Not even somewhere else. I don't even have to imagine, tell you to imagine you know, what we saw with Whitfield. Imagine it in our context. Now, you don't even have to imagine the buildings. You can see every single one of them. Albert Street, Warwick, Toowoomba. The buildings still stand. They don't need to be there. They're just dead buildings if inside of them is not the gospel being preached. But it's in our backyard. It's here. We're praying, Lord, this, something spontaneous in its outbreak, natural though rapid in its development, but Lord God, abiding in its results, following the preaching of the gospel, starting inside the church. Lord, give us again this life principle of William G. Taylor. If anyone serves Jesus, they, the Father, will honor. Can you stand up with me? I want to pray over this concept, this thought. This word of William's life, he said at the end of his life, we have loved our work. Souls were saved. Prosperity was brought to the churches. He says here, at at the pain of having to move on because of the pains and the trials of itinerant ministry, we tore ourselves away from the sphere of labor, which my wife and I still look upon as one of the happiest of our life. If the Lord were to give this, I assure you, it will be the happiest season of all of your life. Father God, we thank you for examples like William G. Taylor, who seem to us, though a denominational way, though a century ago, though uh, different in his uh, uh, language, in his age, in his styles than uh, what might seem modern to us, yet he's a brother of ours, embodying for us a, a modern Hebrews 11. He belongs in the, in the hall of faith. He stands before you now worshipping, disembodied, awaiting the day of glorification and receiving so many rewards for his life of labor wherewith he, he gave himself up to death. He suffered much for your kingdom. He followed where Jesus was. He honored and served Jesus and was honored by you, O Father in the name of Jesus and in the work of Jesus. We pray that, Lord God, you would give to us a heart and a humility, a gospel-mindedness, a hunger, a discontentedness that he had, a, a zeal and a, 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 an itchy feet a part, a degree to our life that we would just not sit contented in whatever it is that we see now, but that we would pray and expect for something spontaneous, something rapid yet natural and something abiding in result that would be poured out by your Holy Spirit and your sovereign love in our day, in our time and in our land. Father God, we ask that you would uh, meet with us even now, that those who are among us, like the stewards and deacons under Taylor, who are here, members, attendees, but not truly converted, you would give to them now a self naughting hope in Jesus Christ alone, a fleeing from self and a running to the cross for salvation. We pray, Lord God, that in this moment you would break parts of us that we have set up against you in unrepentance, in intolerance of your law and in callousness of heart, maybe out of fear of reputation or thinking too much about what results might be, what might happen to us, what, it, what effect it might have in our life, Lord God, would you bring us truly to repentance of sin, to throwing them out of our life, to taking those heavy weights off board so that we may arrive safely to shore. Would you please do that in us that we might be more holy vessels? Would you make each one of us like that young 15-year-old William, uh, zealous to see souls saved? And would you give to us emblems of your love and seals of your favor and save people through our evangelism? Some, some people are here today, Lord, and they... They truly have the horror of admitting to you that no other soul has come to find Jesus through their labor. And we ask that you would change that. We ask that you would save someone else through their work. We ask that you would pour on us a spirit of prayer and humility and, and, uh, and zeal for your name. And that as we break into groups now to pray, that you would be pleased to give us a spirit of 
intercession and petition and ask for those holy things which your word instructs us and directs us and your providence allows for us to pray for. Please hear our prayers as they are made only in Jesus' name, who himself is praying for us presently. Everybody said?